time. So we're moving on to the first session of the conference, which is of course about uh, interactive radiotherapy in, uh, in uh, breast cancer treatment. Um, and I'm gonna be jointly uh, chairing the session with uh, Professor Giant Vaidya from UCL. And um, I will kickstart the session just by giving you a couple of sentences of background. This is a, one of the first device trials in living memory. And it's also an example of a technology that was developed in brain surgery for brain tumors that was then applied to breast surgery. And the first patient to have been recruited into the large target A trial was back in March 2000. And of course, um, Michael Baum, who, who put it together along with Jay Vaidya, can be proud for having recruited the first patient into interoperative, any interoperative radiotherapy trial when target A uh, started. So the long awaited results of the target A trial were published in the British Medical Journal just in August this year. And we're gonna kickstart the session by Jay uh, presenting the data from the trial and giving you a more detailed background of interoperative radiotherapy. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. Uh, I shall now uh, share the screen and give about 20, 22 minutes of, uh, um, so there it is. So let this work. So. PowerPoint, PowerPoint, share, okay. Okay, right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I hope to give some background and uh, long-term results of the targeted trial published recently. So uh, this is a photograph of the writing committee and the list of all the 39 authors on the right. And I wish to thank the International Steering Committee, uh, which then moved on to the Independent Trial Steering Committee chaired by Professor Freddie Hamdi. Uh, so acknowledgements are due to all the investigators and teams in every one of these 33 centers who participated in the trial and every patient who took part uh, in the randomization process and uh, taking the treatments. So these are all the targeted investigators and authors of the BMJ uh, publication last uh, in uh, three months ago. So the target A randomized trial asked a simple question can risk-adapted single-dose intraoperative radiotherapy um, substitute and replace the three to six weeks of daily post-operative whole breast radiotherapy? I'm trying to close the questions here so I can see my own slides, I'm sorry. Um, right, so the trial started in two th March 2000, as Michael said, and completed recruitment eight years ago in July 2012. So this is a slide showing my potential conflict of interest. We had grant funding from to UCL, from Department of Health and IHR HTA, and we have received honorary and travel reimbursement from Carl Zeiss. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you clearly. Thank you, okay. Uh, so we have moved from radical surgery to more targeted surgery in the 100 years from 1894 to 1995. And in the last 20 years, we have tried to move from radical radiotherapy to more targeted radiotherapy. And that's the story of 25 years that I'll try and say, tell you in 25 minutes. So when someone has breast cancer, this is the dilemma one faces. You tell a patient you've got breast cancer and then you have to ask the patient when they come to the hospital every day for three to six weeks of radiotherapy. If they say, yes, we can preserve their breast. And if they say no, the only option which has been there for the last so many years is to do a mastectomy. And this is not uh, limited to UCSF, where it, uh, people don't want to cross the Bay Bridge to have radiotherapy every day. It happens in India, it happens in Denmark, it happens in Australia, and it happens in the UK. As you can see, uh, I'll come to this in more detail, uh, there are long distances that people need to travel for radiotherapy. So the, the, re the way we started this whole process was that Whole breast radiotherapy is considered essential after lumpectomy for breast cancer, but traveling is onerous. So many choose a mastectomy. <laughs> we had uh, data from the laboratory that multicentric foci in breast cancer may not be clinically relevant. 
So these microscopic cancers, in spite of them being present, local recurrence appears to occur mostly near the original cancer. So this was the academic insight that led to the idea of irradiating only the tumor bed and to do it during lumpectomy. So it started with an academic insight where target IOT was conceived. The device was made with industry collaboration and that was tested whether this approach and the device work in the randomized target A trial. So this is a photograph of a multidisciplinary team where you can see Professor Michael Baum, Professor Christopher Saunders, who is on the panel, Professor Jeffrey Tobias, Dr. Neil Mitra, with whom the first uh, laboratory work was done, and uh, I'm much younger there. So um, this is a photograph taken from the first case where you can see the tumor bed into which the applicator goes in. This is how it looks in the operation theater. And this photograph was taken in Italy in Aviano. And you can see Professor Baum and Professor Tobias in the operation theaters. Now, this is a meeting for surgeons. So I wanted to give a, a little bit of detail about the operation itself. This is a case done only recently. And you can see the tumor is excised and it was a bit of skin was taken because it was very close to the skin. And that's a X-ray of the specimen, which shows the tumor in the center of the specimen. So the most of the work is already done by the surgeons. And this is the time when you need to do the IORT. The first photograph on the left shows how the first string suture is taken in the tumor bed. And the second photograph shows at the end of the first string with the applicator going in. And this is a di hand-drawn diagram that shows how the red line shows where the first string should be taken blue line is not where it should be taken because the aim is for this green tumor bed to completely enclose the applicator sphere so that it gets all the radiation. So green is what the tumor bed is, which is what you want to irradiate. And the applicator sphere takes the position of the specimen of the cancer excision. Once this concept is understood by the operating surgeon, then positioning the purse string and making sure it works is pretty simple. And I'll show a very small video of the purse string being taken. So you can see the purse string there being taken so that it is not too close to skin and not too deep. It should be taken so that everything deep to that is in a position with the applicator surface. And the applicator is a spherical applicator from where the radiation occurs. So you can see that these are the last two stitches of the purse string, which has gone all around the edges of the tumor uh, of the cavity. And so that's how the purse string looks. And you can see in the next slide where you can see the uh, applicator um, so going in the tumor bed and then the purse string is tied. And this is how you can check how it works. After that is done, uh, this is how it looks with the device gone into the breast. And it's been done during COVID times, as you can see with the full PPE. And that's how it looks in the operation theater. And at this time, people leave the operation theater for about 20 minutes or 25 minutes, have your coffee and come back. By the time you also get the sentinel node results and then you simply close. So radiotherapy is delivered immediately after um, lumpectomy. This is focused radiation to the tumor bed. It targets tissues at the highest risk of relapse and avoids normal structures, example, the heart and the lungs. So it's a precision and immediacy. That's the most important principle here. You get different sizes of applicators. So you can choose the size of the applicator depending on the size of the tumor bed. And it gets completed during the operation itself. The histopathology in this patient was a 25 millimeter grade two and grade three cancer, completely excised with the smallest margin oh. anteriorly and no lymphovascular invasion, no lymph nodes were involved. So this patient therefore did not need any further radiotherapy. Uh, essentially, she mainly needed um, endocrine therapy and possibly uh, chemotherapy based on further tests. So the original technique was published uh, nearly 20 years ago and the first 25 patients. So in March, 2000, we launched the Target A trial. Target A trial was a comparison between risk adapted intraoperative radiotherapy versus EBRT. So by risk adapted, it meant that patients after lumpectomy during the same operation had the IORT given and postoperatively, if some pre-specified factors were found, they also received whole breast radiotherapy in about 20% 20, 20 of patients. So 80% didn't need any further radiotherapy. You can see how the inclusion criteria are very broad. 
They were more than 45 years of age with unifocal invasive ductal carcinoma and tumor size just less than three, three or three and a half centimeters in size. MRI was not a requirement. The first publication came out in 2020 where Lancet put our conclusion on the front page that selected patients with early breast cancer should have the option of having target IORT instead of for breast radiotherapy. So while waiting for long-term results, many obvious benefits of target IORT were confirmed in the following papers. Firstly, cosmetic outcome was superior with IORT because much smaller area of radio, uh, breast is irradiated. Quality of life is superior with target IORT. These are data from Germany and from Australia, which show that the quality of life and cosmetic outcome is better with intraoperative radiotherapy compared with whole breast. Patients have less pain. They have less breast and arm symptoms with target IORT. This is data from Copenhagen with uh, Dr. Henrik Flieger there. And there is less pain, less breast symptoms and less arm symptoms. Importantly, what is the preference? Patients prefer target IORT, and this is despite a tolerated higher local recurrence rate of 2.5%. Some people even say 10% is all right, I want to have the IORT. And this is not just patients, even doctors prefer target IORT if they had to have, have an operation for breast cancer. And these data are from US and in Australia. Now target is also cost saving. Now the cost savings in the US is very high. Over five years, Dr. Michael Alvarado estimated this to be about $1.4 billion because radiotherapy there is much more expensive, but it is cost saving the UK as well. And about 9 million pounds in the UK would be saved every year if we adopt target IORT. And this does not include the environmental and patient and social, societal costs. And these were investigated by Mr. Coombs who is in the, on the panel. Uh, where they calculated how much time would be saved by patients. Uh, and uh, you can see this diagram, the photograph here, which shows each center in the UK, which has got a radiotherapy and each circle is a 13 mile radius. And each of those would lead to um, patients traveling more than 13 miles. There is a video here, but uh, I don't think it is uh, it works. So I'm not going to show that. But essentially, there are 750 miles of travel and 30 hours saved by a typical patient if they take target IORT. So we could say that target IORT, if adopted everywhere, could reduce global warming as well. There is one more thing: is that target improves tumor microenvironment, and this is the interesting biology. When you do surgery, and this comes as a horrifying news to us surgeons, is when you operate, the fluid that collects in the wound actually stimulates cancer cell proliferation, motility, and invasiveness. But if you take wound fluid from patients who have had IORT, it is much lower. So you can see the top panel here, which shows cancer cells moving very fast, whereas the bottom panel, which is bathing in cell in fluid taken from patients who have had IORT, doesn't move very, very fast. And this work is done in Italy. And you can see Prof. Dr. Masaruth there, um, who is on part of the panel. So in 2013, we published the five-year results. But breast cancer has a long natural history. So long-term outcomes are important. And you can see that we have 19 years of follow-up that can be there potentially, because the trial has run for 19 years. And we, for this, we set the bar very high. What we said is that follow-up was considered complete and we'll only analyze if follow-up was complete if 95% patients had at least five-year complete follow-up. So in order to get that, it took some time and quite a lot of effort. And you can see... I'm oh, sorry about that. One has immigrated to Finland and one have immigrated to Bulgaria. And this is out of how many patients? It's out of uh, 534 patients, we have lost two, and I'm so sorry for that. I'm trying to get data on the lady who uh, immigrated to Finland. I got a phone number, but she don't pick up the phone. But the one who immigrated to Bulgaria, I'm sorry to say, I think I lost her. Oh. <laughs> so this is the quest that was followed by every participants around the, around the world and helped by the trial center team, we managed to get there. And you can see in this diagram how 
these are the graphs that show the expected and the actual follow-up of patients, how close they are between each other, as well as between the two randomized arms. So we are very comfortable that these data are robust and reliable. And in the process, the amount of data in target A is the highest amongst PBR trials for invasive breast cancer. So the unblinded data set was sent to the Professor Max Balsara in July, 2019, once the SAP was signed off by the independent TSC. So that's the randomization. The two arms of the trial compared very well in terms of age, BMI, and other tumor factors. There were no difference between these two arms. As far as we know, the advantages to patients are that surgery and radiotherapy is completed at the same time. There's good cosmetic outcome, less pain, fewer complications. Now, the most important patient question for the patient is, what is the chance of my living without the cancer coming back? And these are the main results. So non-inferiority was the uh, way the trial was designed. And we had set the boundary at 2.5% difference between the two arms of the trial. So at five years, this was achieved. So non-inferiority of target IORT with EBRT was confirmed. So that was the main thing that in the beginning that we would set up. And to put this in perspective, this is a diagram that shows how out of 100 people in the trial at the end of five years, what is the situation? So we find that on the left-hand side, target IORT, right-hand side, lumpectomy, the purple dots are all patients who are alive. So most patients are very well. And you can see there is hardly a difference between the two arms. So people do very well and have the benefit of the convenience. So 96 versus 95 alive, local recurrence is two versus one, and distant disease is the same, and diet is four versus five. So this is the diagram we created for patients to get the raw data to um, assess what the outcome is and choose which ones they want. What about the long-term outcomes? And these are the kaplan meier graphs of long-term outcomes of local recurrence-free survival all the way up to 12 years and invasive local recurrence-free survival. No difference was detected between the two arms of the trial. No difference was found in mastectomy-free survival and distant disease-free survival. The lines are on, literally on top of each other. What about mortality? So breast cancer mortality, this is a magnified graph which shows no difference found between uh, two arms for breast cancer mortality, but for non-breast cancer mortality, you can see there was a significant difference between the two arms favoring target IORT. This is quite a big difference, and that led to a separation of curves for overall mortality, although it did not reach statistical significance. So back in 2000 was the first day first patient was randomized and 2010 was the first publication. And now we have shown how breast cancer control with target IORT, risk adapted target IORT was comparable to EBRT with reduced non-breast cancer mortality. So these are the results in one slide, which show that local recurrence-free survival was similar and non-breast cancer mortality was lower. And in absolute terms at 12 years, this difference was about 4.4% and I'll come to this in a second. There are some important points I would like to emphasize. I've already said this, how this is one of the largest trials. So one of the criticisms of not long follow-up enough is no longer true. This is an important point to recognize that target A had a substantial high-risk population and typical of the cohort seen in our normal breast cancer clinics. 20% patients were grade three, this is typical of our clinics. 22% had involved nodes and 19% were either ER negative or PR negative. And most patients were under the age of 70. This is how our typical breast cancer clinics are. And it is not that supplemental EBRT was given to all high-risk patients. Most high-risk patients actually did not receive supplemental EBRT. And this was because it was given to those who had lobular cancer or who had positive margins. So grade three, node negativity, node positivity and ER negativity wasn't a determinant of giving external beam radiotherapy at all. There has been some suggestion that this is such little dose that there may be like no radiotherapy, but that's not really true. The CALGB, BASO2 and PRIME2 trials have tested whether no radiotherapy works and it has been not possible. It has been challenging to define a population which will not benefit from radiotherapy. So for example, all these groups had a smaller number of patients. All of them had patients over the age of 65 
with small tumors who are grade one or two and node negative and ER positive. But despite not having such restriction, uh, despite having such restrictions, their local recurrence rate was four to 6%. And we target, despite having a higher risk population had two to three times lower recurrence risk. There's been a question about reduced mortality with target. Is that plausible? Now it is plausible. EBRT, whole breast radiotherapy, has been shown to cause cardiac perfusion defects within six months. So finding a um, cardiac mortality difference is not really surprising. It is also consistent with other partial breast radiation trials. And this is a meta-analysis which we published firstly in the Red Journal, then in the Lancet, which shows that there is indeed a reduction in non-breast cancer mortality when you take all the partial breast radiation trials, which leads to an overall mortality reduction. And this is not a small difference. And it is, comes from cardiovascular and pulmonary causes and other cancers, which seems plausible. And you think about it, it is even more important in patients with lung cancer. Sorry, patients who smoke, smoke. And this is a study from early breast cancer trialist group with modern radiation therapy doses. They, they estimate that 23% of smokers who have external beam radiotherapy for breast cancer will die because of heart attacks. This is a 6% increase. Now one cannot imagine that radiotherapy will reduce mortality by 6% from breast cancer. So giving target IRT to smokers will reduce overall mortality by about 6%. And I ask whether it's ethical to not offer target IRT to eligible patients who are smokers. And this is not a study. This study is from early breast cancer trialist collaborative group. There has been, uh, this is the next point I wanted to uh, emphasize is the fast forward trial and other partial breast radiation trials. So fast forward is not partial breast radiation. And this needs to be emphasized time and again because it has been touted as something else. It is whole breast radiation. It requires seven to 15 extra visits. It irradiates the whole breast. It causes scattered irradiation to link vital organs. They didn't find a mortality reduction. And there is toxicity in terms of hardened and firm breast. A quarter of patient complain about this. So to put it in a more, um, in a, this is a way of putting it in. It is whole breast radiotherapy while it is targeted. It's many visits, no visits. Despite having similar type of cancer patients, the re recurrence risk is the same. Long-term outcomes of fast forward are not available. There is no difference in mortality and increased toxicity. So personally, I'm not much in favor of fast forward trial. And that is, I don't say just because I don't like it, but that's the data. Now, this is a busy slide. And these are the last two slides in which I'm talking about partial breast radiation techniques. So I'm only, only going to focus on the first and the last column. First column is target A, and the last column is the import low protocol, which is the ma main protocol used for partial breast radiation in the UK. So the number of patients are many more in target IORT. They are more representative of our clinic population compared to the low risk population in import low. The non-inferiority has been con con confirmed in target A. Breast cancer control is similar and it's given during surgery. The toxicity is lower. Deaths are reduced with target A, but not so found in, IMR, in uh, import low. There is scatter radiation. And most importantly, it requires many visits to the operation to the radiotherapy center, about 15 days every day for three weeks. This is particularly relevant in COVID times. In conclusion of the target A trial, it's achieved comparable long-term control, reduced non-breast cancer mortality, and has better quality of life, cosmetically superior, less pain, more convenient for the patient, less tra travel time, and lower cost to the healthcare system. It has been adopted all over the world. As you can see, these are meetings of target users around the world. It was also, and these are all the centers where IORT is offered all over the world, and about 45,000 patients have been treated, particularly since the last publication in 2009 and 2013. UK NICE re recommended target IORT in 2018, and we are hoping that the new publication will make it, uh, have made headlines in Times along with Joe Biden. Um, and 
ASTRO, the American Society of Radiation Oncology, tweeted the results in October and patients really want it. And these are tweets from patients. And I end by talking, giving a small video of Marcel, who is on the panel. You can listen to that. I'm Marcel Bernstein. Eight years ago, I was diagnosed with early stage breast cancer. I had it for two months only before I was cured. I had target IORT at the same time as the operation to remove the cancer. I spent one night in hospital and I was back at work within days. No pain at any time, no complications, no scarring. I can't even tell where on my breast the surgery was and no recurrence, eight years. And that isn't just me being lucky. Studies show that my experience is similar to that of other women who've had target. I am so happy I was able to have this treatment. So uh, I'll talk about target B later on, uh, which is a currently running randomized trial for high risk patients. And uh, this is just to advertise that this trial is currently running and has recruited a lot. But I want to end here so that we have a good panel discussion. Thank you very much.